So you want to play Wrath and Glory. You've got a bunch of mates, or have found some willing victims online, and you're eager to get started. Here, I'll give you a more in-depth guide to creating a framework, things to discuss during your session zero, and the choices and differences in tiers. Your framework is what Wrath and Glory refers to as the overview of your adventures and missions your players are going to experience. These determine the types of characters and species your players can choose, and in turn their archetype. Unexpectedly, it can even put restrictions on the types of war gear they come across, who they come across, and threats they might encounter. For instance, should you decide to take your players into the bowels of a hive world, the chances of them coming across nobility, advanced power armour, and their characters being of a Xenos origin becomes increasingly unlikely. Therefore, you have already restricted these choices for your players. This restriction isn't a bad thing at all. It's these types of things that are advantageous to have in discussion as soon as possible. They keep the game grounded in its theme, and the players know exactly what to expect and what to lean towards when making the important first steps into your game. During these discussions, talk and discuss what your players' goals might be. Have a clear idea of what they want to achieve from their character, even if it's just something as broad as kill everything or as simple as just have fun. Their own character ideas and goals might be interesting plot hooks for you as the GM. A couple of simple examples could be the remnants of a squad of Imperial Guardsmen looking to be conscripted to fight for the glory of the Emperor, agents of the Imperium tracking down and destroying any chaos infiltrations amongst the hive bowels of Gilead Primus, maybe a bunch of orc boys set to throw an uprising and create a wow on the desert planet they inhabit, but must first take down local gangs and fight their way to the top of the pecking order, Aladari Corsairs looking to plunder ancient riches or act as diplomats to gain favour with local rogue traders. A space marine unit that has been assigned to rid a nearby space hulk of Gene Stealer Menace. Or maybe they simply just want to bring a ragtag bunch of mismatched Imperial archetypes to the table and see where it leads them. You might find that in doing so, your framework and the archetype your players are interested in naturally fit into a certain tier of play. If they're off on a diplomatic adventure, they'll probably bring characters that align more to this role. If you then throw them into a space hulk bringing with Gene Stealers, they might fill out of their depth. It's up to you as the GM to help guide them through the parts that feel opposing to their character choices if you throw them into an odd situation. Remember, you act as an ally, not an enemy. At the end of the day, whatever you're planning, try to make sure that it promotes cooperation, aligns with the setting, and gives all of your players a clear set goal. And most of all, have fun. Patrons are a great way of adding a mutual contact for that first, or only, source of purpose going on the adventures the characters are about to experience. It's a good idea to take a look at the patrons in both the core rulebook and the Forsaken System Player's Guide for inspiration and sources. There are plans to introduce more in the future, but for now, these are the only books published as of time of making this guide. Just like patrons, maybe the agents are working for a particular faction. Maybe they're working against a particular faction. Introducing the concepts of factions around the Gilead system could be influential in the decision making of your players, but at the very least, give them a small taste of what life is like in the Gilead system. Now you've discussed framework, it's time to set the tiers. Generally, both myself and Cubicle 7 have a history of setting their adventures at tier 2 bracket system, either 1 and 2, 2 and 3, and 4 on its own. You can go higher than this if you wish, simply by adding more experience points to the mix, or lower the tiers by removing them. For example, your party might be the best of the best marines, and go for a tier 5 experience by handing them 500 experience to play with during the character creation. Or, they could be green-faced new recruit guardsmen, barely out of training, receiving only 75 experience points for a tier 1 game. An example framework table can be found on page 20 of the core rulebook, and looks like this. Tier 1 is the most basic. I say basic not because it's easy. Tiers aren't necessarily levels of difficulty, but more a descriptor to your players to describe where they sit in the Gilead system. They have the least battle experience, the least influence, and the least wealth, and the least contacts. They might be the local guard of a mining colony, dragged into the middle of a small chaos cult incursion, or a scum gang takeover. Tier 2 is where I comfortably sit with most of my games. I want my characters to feel out of place in front of inquisitors, intimidated by officials, but powerful enough to feel a little above the common folk and influential enough to ask questions and disagree with people. Here your players would expect to have to fight Aladari Corsairs, Orc Warbands, 
lesser demons or rogue servitors. They'd also hold enough influence to be approached by commissars and a few inquisitors of the lower orders to fulfil their requests. Tier 3 will make your characters feel battle-hardened. They are the unsung heroes of the Imperium used only to get the job done or quell rebellions. By tact or by force if necessary. Players should expect to hold a level of authority or recognition amongst some factions, even if not very high. They would be pit against things like Chaos Space Marine squads, bands of psychers, or gene stealer cults. Tier 4 players will feel like battle hardened, cream of the crop killing machines, wizened and charismatic diplomats, or knowledgeable and talented psychers. They would be at the forefront of any incursion, or a tactical unit infiltrating behind enemy lines. Upper echelons of the Inquisition will keep these guys in their back pockets and will likely give them access to some of the best weapons in the Imperium and the Black Market. Like I touched upon earlier, a Tier 1 doesn't necessarily mean that you feel underpowered, nor should a Tier 4 feel overpowered. It's a way of keeping the gameplay and expectations balanced. As the GM, it's up to you to make the encounters, be it combat or diplomacy or otherwise, feel like a sweeping victory or a narrow win and these can be achieved at any tier of play. The best way to get a feel for what to expect from each tier level is to read through some of the published adventures. Even better, my advice would be to begin with one of these adventures, as they create a more polished and ready scenario for your players to begin with, and give you, the GM, less background work to concentrate on straight after a session zero. Either way, ultimately, try and make this a group decision. If you have a set goal in mind as a GM, of course, that's fine too, but your players will be far more invested if they're working towards goals that they themselves align with. In the next video, we take those tiers and framework and use them to build a character. Thanks for listening.